Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with How I Discovered Elgar. Now, this is a really interesting kind of a story, especially if you're not British, because if you're American and you have a normal upbringing and you go to school and you graduate, chances are you marched down the aisle for graduation to Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance number one, the march not the outer sections. We didn't know it had outer sections. We only knew the big tune. You know, that one. I graduated to that over and over again as I graduated. And, and I didn't know who wrote it, of course. I knew it was called Pomp and Circumstance March Number 1. That I knew. And I, I, after that, it wasn't a clue about anything else, that there were more of them that I cared about, or that there was some guy who wrote it. I thought he was like Sousa, a guy who wrote marches. I mean, that was about as far as I got. But then I was still in, well, I was in high school at that point, I think, in my life. Yeah, early, the early years of high school. And my mother was a teacher. She taught at a um, a Hebrew day school, a Jewish religious school, parochial school in Connecticut. And I used to pop in there once in a while, you know, we'd drive home together or whatever, and I would see her, and she asked me for a favor. She needed a recording of Pomp and Circumstance March Number 1 because she was preparing her class for graduation. So I went out and I grabbed a recording, because I never bought any Elgar, actually, but I got a, a recording, and the recording was uh, the Pomp and Circumstance Marches coupled with, and here's the kicker, the Crown of India Suite. It was with Daniel Barenboim on Columbia, now Sony. And we. I, I looked at it and I went, oh my, look, there's more than one of these suckers. So I listened to all of them at one point or another. But more importantly, I listened to the Crown of India Suite, which ends with the March of the Mughal Emperors, which I still consider to be the greatest thing that Elgar ever did. The March of the Mughal Emperors is absolutely fabulous. It is the most unapologetically joyous celebration of imperialism in all of music. And I love it. Unashamedly, it's fantastic. And that's how I knew Elgar was a great composer from the Crown of India suite. I mean, it had also that sort of exoticism that's so much fun. You know, it's the dance of the notch girls or something. I don't know what a notch is and I don't know what girls do with them, but it was charming. So anyway, so I began to become aware when in my early high school years, like, you know, eighth or ninth grade, somewhere in there, that he was a guy who wrote music besides the Pomp and Circumstance March number one. Well, the next thing up on the list, of course, was the Enigma Variations. It's a great title. Then I realized no one knew what the Enigma was, which kind of ruined it for me because I didn't see any point in listening to something that had an Enigma if you couldn't eventually figure out what the answer to the Enigma was supposed to be. But it turns out nobody ever could, which really kind of pissed me off. Uh, it's a lovely work, but it didn't really impress me that much. I mean, I, you read the notes about it and and it, it has so much lore behind it. You know, you put two pennies on the timpani for the, the, the ship at the, towards the end there. And you do, you know, all these, all these things that English players know and the English cultural thing that surrounds Elgar and his music. And I was so put off by all of that. It just impressed me as the acme of provincialism. It really did. And so the Enigma Variations, okay, I thought it was nice. It's okay. That was fine. Um, and then, and then after that, um, I started reading Gramophone because I started really collecting records. And when you start reading Gramophone, oh my God, it's like, you know, the Church of Elgar. And, and that also I found totally off-putting as well as the Penguin Guide, just because of all of the insider information about it. The fact that, you know, everybody knew everybody and they were all like, he, 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 friendly. It's Elgar. Ooh, yeah. And, and, uh, and in addition to that, uh, that sort of off-puttingness, there was just this assumption that he was the greatest thing that ever lived. And when I listened to the actual music, for the most part, I started to listen to the symphonies, I listened to the cello concerto, which never thrilled me. It just seemed to me there wasn't anything he did that other people didn't do better. It took me a very long time to detach 
the music from the way it was being presented with that smug certainty that everything he did was fabulous and that if you didn't think so, you, you, you was something wrong with you. Um, and I, I just, the whole culture of Elgar in the UK, as it was being expressed through through the, the British musical press, principally gramophone, I found completely alienating. And it, and it really put me off his music. It, it did for quite a while. Then I, I got this wonderful recording of the Second Symphony. It's wonderfully bad, actually, by Yevgeny Svetlanov on Melodia. It was like at a yard sale or something. It was horrible. Oh my God, it was so vulgar and blowsy and over the top. I'll never forget the opening of the first movement. You know, you know, with the da 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 Oh, golly gee, I knew it was a terrible performance. I said, well, if this is what a bad one sounds like, I want to know what a good one sounds like. And so I got Adrian Bolt on, on EMI, uh, Angel Records in those days, and I it blew me away. I thought it was absolutely glorious, a magnificent piece. I never liked the first as much as the second. Some people, some people it's the other way around, but I was so impressed by just, you know, the 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 emotional intensity and grandeur and the bigness of vision. I just thought it was wonderful. So I knew that there was somebody there who was worth paying attention to entirely apart from what was being said and what I was reading about Elgar. Uh, and then, you know, you realize that he was like a neurotic Catholic and, and you know, all the all the stuff behind his life. And he starts to get a little bit more interesting. But what really did it for me, what opened the Elgarian floodgates was uh, the the disc by Alexander Gibson and the Scottish National Orchestra of Elgar Overtures. In the South, Cocaine and Foissart and the, the Handel thing, the Overture in D minor, the orchestration, that recording did it. I was sold, for, especially with In the South, which I think is absolutely glorious. And that recording sounded so good. I mean, it was like a demonstration disc sonically. And the music making was so effortless. It was just so powerful and, 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 and exciting and fresh. You know, it didn't have any of that sort of late romantic decadent, you know, sludge that kind of defaces performances of Elgar. That's what happened when Sinopoli played Elgar. We went back to decadent sludge. But it, it, the Gibson stuff was just beautiful absolutely beautiful. And from then on, I started to be vastly more sympathetic towards what I was hearing. I mean, there were some works that I just never quite caught into. I mean, like the cello concerto, you know, we all have works that we like and some we don't like by every composer. So that was pretty natural, I thought. That was also because the cello concerto always came in tandem with the tragic life of Jacqueline Dupre, whose life was tragic, and she had multiple sclerosis. I have multiple sclerosis. I know what she was going through, at least to a degree, not to the extent she suffered, but you know, I knew. And 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 my, I have. She has all my sympathy. What nauseates me is using that as a pretext to ignore actual musical values or to have a sensible musical discussion. I'm not saying that the cello concerto is not a great work. Maybe it is. I, it doesn't doesn't touch me. But but the constant flogging of of her life and her death and the cello concerto and Barbaroli and ah oh, my god it, again it was just it was just so it had nothing to do with music. It was about everything but music. And and that really kind of irritated me because I, I like music for itself for the most part. The the backstory I don't care about. Not about works and particularly not about performances of works for the most part. And so, you know, I, Elgar, the English have done their very best to make Elgar as unappetizing as possible for anyone who is not part of the club. And I happen to think a lot, I know a lot of English people, I have plenty of English friends who are also not part of the club and who find it as off-putting as I do. Because it really is, it really is kind of insulting and, and, and smug and, and, and arrogant 
you know, to be pushing him the way that he gets pushed. And, and here's what really pissed me off. The performance of the Enigma Variations that really got me was the Telark recording with David Zinman, which is fab fabulous, and which, to its credit, the Penguin Guide gave like a rosette to. They, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And, and good for them for being, you know, so honest and open about it and willing to listen to it. But that was a rarity because up until that point, and for the most part still, if you're not English and if you weren't part of the club, then you couldn't play Elgar. And it struck me, and I would, at that point I was a critic and I was writing about it all the time, that the English musical press was the worst, the, they were the worst kind of ambassador for their music because rather than welcoming foreign performances, other people doing it, you know, recordings happening not in the UK. They were ready to trash anything that was not done by someone who was a member of the club. And again, it had nothing to do with music. That's what made that review of the, the Zinman Elgar astonishing. But it was astonishing as an exception to the rule, not because it signaled any major change of heart. And of course, for that reason, Whenever anyone else did Elgar, I mean, when Slacken recorded Elgar or Lytton recorded Elgar, they, they had to go do it in England. Even Bernstein, you know, with his very controversial Enigma variations. I mean, his idea was to like stick it to him by doing his demented version of it in England with the BBC Symphony. You had to do it in the UK. You had to, to make obeisance at the shrine of Elgardom or else you were gonna get trashed in the British press. And, and, and in gramophone, particularly, um, it's probably less the case now because they've tried to open it up a little bit. But it really is, it really is a wonderful example of how uh, people can be their own worst enemy musically because Elgar's music is great music. There's no question about it. Some things I think won't travel terribly well, like The Dream of Gerontius. Ugh. I mean, great music, appalling libretto. The text is just scandalously bad but but the music is wonderful uh, i think happen to think the apostles could do fantastically well i think it's a much greater work and it's absolutely lovely and i'm not even a member of that particular club but i think it's a great work y you know there's a lot of music um that he wrote and he wasn't all that prolific that could be quite popular i enjoy his earlier works now you know caractacus and the black knight and all that stuff that's fun those earlier pre-Enigma works that show that he didn't just pop up from nothing, that he'd been working for a long time and writing some very considerably fine music within that English choral tradition, which is now quite outmoded and, and spat upon by everybody, which I think is wrong. I mean, great music is great music, whatever tradition it's written in. So, so yeah, it's taken me a very, very long time to get into Elgar because I had to find my own path, as do we all ultimately. I mean, you could you could join the club, you could drink the poison Kool-Aid um, and leave it at that if you want. And it may just be that the music strikes you immediately is so fabulous that nothing anybody says is going to, is going to dissuade you. Um, that's more likely to happen now because people read less criticism. What gramophone says matters much less to the English speaking world, which I think can only be accounted a healthy thing and and i you we can we can just listen and make up our own minds but in those days when i was growing up if you were looking for guidance particularly with respect to british music that was where you went for the guidance and the guidance was just terrible absolutely terrible so it took me another 20 years or so to get into elgar which isn't a bad thing because there were many other things to listen to in the meantime but uh it's a cautionary tale to you know, use your own ears and form your own opinions, and and uh, take what everybody says, um, if it's not musically grounded, if it's culturally grounded or nationalistically grounded, or or you know, based on anything but but the actual sound of the music itself, then you know, beware. It's it's caveat emptor. You know, let the buyer beware. Um, but Elgar is a great composer, and I'm very happy that I grew up and came to love some of his works that I would never have otherwise encountered um, had it not been for my desire to ignore what I was being told 
by the English critics. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me and let me know how you discovered Elgar and whether your experience was anything like mine and how you responded to it. I'm awfully curious to find out. Take care.